This week on True Crime Travelers. What do you picture when I say study abroad in Italy? You imagine drinking Aperol Spritz at 4 p.m. in a courtyard. You picture a gorgeous Italian man on a Vespa with a little baguette sticking out of his basket. You picture cobblestone streets and grandmas making pasta, right? You certainly don't imagine that your roommate is going to be murdered, you're going to be arrested, and the entire world is going to be openly hating you for decades to come. Welcome to True Crime Travelers, where we investigate suspicious murders and disappearances around the world, but from a traveler's perspective. We are Alexa and Amelia, award-winning travel experts and the authors behind the Solo Girls Travel Guide book series. We are obsessed with safety and true crime, but I promise we're not here to scare you. We're here to prepare you. I'm nervous for today. There's so much pressure to do this case right because you guys, today's case is the one that you have requested the most. People have been asking us to cover the Amanda Knox case since we started whispering about doing a true crime travel podcast. I know so many of my friends have requested this case and even I requested this particular case. I have been following it for years. But I also know that no one knows this case as you do. So I am really excited to hear your take on this case and to compare notes with you. For those of you that don't know, this case of Amanda Knox and Meredith Kircher that took place in Italy in 2007 is a case that has spanned 20 years of documentaries, books, news coverage, everything. This is one of the biggest criminal cases of our lifetime, and it also happens to be a true crime travel case. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so let's get into it. Imagine coming home from your boyfriend's house to find your front door ajar in another country. You pause, but think nothing of it because you have roommates. Maybe one of them left the door open. And you're returning from a night with your new Italian boyfriend, where you stayed up until about 10 p.m., cuddling, watching movies, cooking dinner, smoking weed, and having sex. So what is the first thing you would want to do when you got home, Em, from a night of movies, sex, and weed? Probably take a shower. That's right. The first thing you want to do is take a shower. And that's what Amanda did. So Amanda Knox is this fresh-faced, no-makeup college girl from here in Seattle. This was back in 2007, FYI. And she was studying abroad in Italy. But she wasn't studying abroad alone, or at least she wasn't living alone, I mean. She was living in a big house with three roommates on the side of a cobblestone street in Perugia, Italy. It's a tiny town. It's really cute. And the house that they live in is like this. So it's a two-story house, and on the bottom, there's two bedrooms where two of her roommates live, and those were Italian roommates, and they have their own door in and out. And then on the top floor is where Amanda's room is, and Amanda, when she got to Italy, she had a roommate, and her name is Meredith Kircher. Meredith is 21 years old. She is from England, and the two of them coincidentally live together. Okay. And I mean, you know, like if you move abroad, you find another foreigner and you're like, Hey, we immediately have something in common. Yeah, for sure. That's really common when you're studying abroad. Mm -hmm. So the two roommates that live downstairs, they were Italian. So they had like their own Italian life. They didn't hang with Amanda and Meredith too much. They were nice, but those two roommates downstairs, they kind of fade into the background of this story. This story is really about Meredith and Amanda. So let's talk about Meredith. Meredith Kircher, born on December 28, 1985, in Southwark, London. She was a British student studying in Perugia, Italy. She is known for being kind and compassionate and a little bit reserved almost. She's really pretty. Her mom, I think, is of Indian descent. And I think I think her dad is white and she's just like stunning. She was studying at the University of Leeds and she was studying European studies with Italian. 
So, of course, she went to Perugia, Italy to participate in this exchange program. And so we have Meredith's kind of like calm demeanor. And then there was Amanda, who's like a Tasmanian devil. In a good way, in a good way. This girl, she is energetic and curious and playful and silly. She's a little weird, to be honest. She's quirky. And she comes from Seattle. And here's something crazy. And this is kind of why I didn't want to do this story right away because it's personal to me. Amanda was studying Italian at the University of Washington, where I went to school. And we went to school at the same time. So let me describe what Amanda looks like to you. She is pretty. She has like Taylor Swift colored hair. She's very like all natural and she wears her hair kind of short, typically just above the shoulders. She's an athlete. She plays soccer and she's actually really good at soccer. But I would say like her fashion sense is very Seattle. Patagonia is everywhere. It's Patagonia's. It's sensible, warm layers. It's minimal makeup and it's like beanies. Okay. So we have these two girls that are very different. They're very different kind of like in every way possible. So their energy didn't mix that well. You know, it was like fire and and ice in the house. And Meredith and Amanda butted heads. They didn't get along on a variety of topics, including housework, like who's going to clean the kitchen, money, like bills. And most of all, Meredith was really not comfortable with Amanda's laissez-faire attitude about sex and weed. So Amanda's on, she's 21, I think, in 2007, and she's discovering herself. I mean, she's abroad in Italy. She's living life. Yeah, and it's her first time away from her parents. And how exciting. So they weren't each other's perfect cup of tea, but they still spent time together. So, you know, they were two foreigners living far away from home. So they leaned on each other to a certain extent. And on October 25th, Meredith and Amanda in Italy, they go to a, like a symphony. And that is where Amanda meets Raphael Selecito. Raphael is this Italian guy that kind of looks like Harry Potter. (laughs) And he's got like big glasses and soft features. And that's probably why Amanda liked him. Amanda loves Harry Potter and she's like such a nerd. So she's like, ooh, an Italian nerd, you know? So Amanda falls for Raphael and hallelujah for Meredith. This means that Amanda is going to be like out of the house a little bit more, you know, because Raphael, he lived just down the street. So Amanda was excited to have an escape from the house, and I'm sure Meredith liked the tranquility of Amanda's absence. So it wasn't weird when Amanda didn't come home one night. Instead, Amanda comes home the next morning. Like if I, if you and I, when when we lived in Bali, if we had like a little dalliance with a guy, we would come home and immediately go right to each other and want to gossip. gossip. Yeah. We would be, I'd be like, oh my God. Like, Because we it? love living together. But when you have a roommate, you don't really like, it's kind of like, you really try to find the ways to avoid the conversation yeah. or like bumping into each other. It's just uncomfortable. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. So when Amanda came home that morning, she didn't go right to Meredith's room to be like, oh my gosh, I just like this guy so much. Instead, Amanda went straight to the shower. So this is where things get like a little weird. Okay. So Amanda goes straight into the shower and on her way into the shower, she looks in the sink and she sees a couple drops of blood. Strange, she thought, like someone must have cut themselves shaving or something, but just a little, just a couple drops of blood. Then Amanda gets in the shower. She's washing the hangover off of herself. And then she gets out of the shower. And as Amanda steps out of the shower, she notices more blood a bloody footprint on the bath mat. And she's like, what the fuck is that? And while that may be enough for most people to stop and go check on other people in the house, Amanda was like, I just don't want to deal with this. Like whatever, whoever is hurt, I just don't want to deal with it. It's 10 a.m. Like I'm I'm hungover. I just don't want to deal with it. Instead, she started blow drying her hair. As she's blow drying, Under the hypnotic hum of the dryer, she zones out a little, and she starts putting some clues together. She's like, the door is ajar, there's blood in the sink, there's blood on the bath mat. And so she starts scanning the bathroom. Like, what else is there? Like, am I okay? 
And that's when she sees it. Shit. Like, like literal oh. shit. Like, like someone used the toilet and did it. That's a flush. gross. I know. And funny enough, as a woman living with another woman, that was the clue to jolt Amanda awake. And she suddenly knows someone is in the house. Or was in the house, at least. Right. So she throws on her clothes, she bolts out of the apartment, and she runs back to Raphael's for help. And so the two return to the house together. Raphael looks around, he sees no one. And then that's when they notice that Meredith's door is not just closed, but it's locked, and it's locked from the inside. So they start banging on the door. They start calling her name. Amanda, she calls Meredith's phone, and Meredith isn't answering the phone. Raphael tries to break the door down with no luck. Then, like out of an Italian sitcom, two police show up. Out of nowhere, okay? Two police show up. And these are civil police. So apparently in Italy, they have like civil police or postal police, which is more just like, you know, run of the mill day to day things. Mm -hmm. And then they have military police, which Mm -hmm. is for crime, which I think is brilliant. We have something similar here in Spain. Oh, tell me. We have like the like the local police, which is, you know, like mm-hmm. traffic stuff. And then you have like a like a high like the state police kind of thing. And then yeah. you have like the Guardia Nacional, which is like usually when there's like home disturbances or like you you complain about your neighbors, these are the guys <laughs> that will show up. Yes. Okay. So it's like this. It's like this. So the two show up because they had gotten a call earlier that day from a, a woman, a local woman, and she had found a cell phone. That was like tossed in her yard. She was like, this is suspicious. So she called those like civil cops and gave it to them. The cops traced the phone back to the address of the cottage where they found this American girl and her new boyfriend trying to kick a door down. So the police were like, hey, what is going on? And once the police understand what's going on, then Raphael picks up the phone and some people are like, why did this happen? They think that this was strange. Raphael picks up the phone and he calls their 911 to summon the military police. And there's a recording of this call. And he basically just says, and he's calm. He basically just says, hey, there was a break in at this apartment. The window is broken, but nothing is stolen. However, we have a locked door and we're trying to get in it. And by the way, Raphael isn't technically Amanda's boyfriend yet. By this point, on this day, the two had only known each other for five days. Oh. So at this point, Amanda's like in that honeymoon phase. You know, Mm. she's like head over heels for this guy. So on that fateful day, as they are waiting for the police to arrive, and as the police start arriving, Raphael and Amanda are standing outside of the cottage. Media starts showing up, police cars, crowds, crime scene investigators, looky loos. And very quickly, the scene in front of the house becomes very busy. That is when the most famous video was taken. And if you know anything about the Amanda Knox case, you probably know which video I'm talking about. This is a video that was enough to create an entire media frenzy and is kind of the trampoline to which this story happens. So basically what is happening in this video is that Raphael and Amanda are standing outside. Raphael is embracing Amanda and he's rubbing her arm. He's comforting her. And you see the look on Amanda's face. She's, she's not crying, but she's confused. You could just see she's like confused, but she's not crying, which is one thing that people were like, Oh, this is horrible. She's not crying. And then Amanda turns her head and Raphael gives her a peck on the lips. And that one peck was like seen worldwide as Amanda and her boyfriend are making out in front of the house. That is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like what was happening inside? I mean, she was obviously not crying. Like there was no body yet. There was, it was like all confusion still, right? It was, right. So Amanda doesn't know exactly what's happening in the house, but this is what is happening in the house. The police enter the house and they manage to break down the door. And there they find a room full of blood. 
a crime scene so horrific that it's clear that there was a very violent struggle. And then, under a blanket, feet sticking out, the police find Meredith's very bloody, naked body. So, trigger warning to anyone, I'm about to get into the gruesome details to an extent. When Meredith's body was found, she was naked, and she had marks on her that suggested she had been held down. She was covered in blood because she had been stabbed a lot. It turns out she had been stabbed nearly 40 times. 40 times. Yeah. 40. And her and you know like stabbing is a very personal crime, yeah. you know, and especially 40 that sounds like rage. But horrifically as well, Meredith had also been sexually assaulted and the bra that she was wearing had been cut off and the hooks were missing. So it sounds like someone was like trying to yank it off mm-hmm. and the hooks probably were, I don't yeah. know. And then, and then it was cut off and her t-shirt was pulled up over her breasts. There was no sign of forced entry at the house, except there was a broken window on the second floor, but the glass was inside the house on top of Meredith's clothes. Instead, you would think, If this happened before Meredith was assaulted, the glass would be under her. So the police were like, this looks like a staged break-in. Like someone staged this, okay? So the police keep looking, they keep looking. And as they look, they find bloody footprints leading from Meredith's room to the bathroom. And then they find that baby blue rug in the bathroom, the bath mat. And it had almost, you know, this perfect bloody footprint suggesting that whoever stepped on it was fully covered in blood themselves, like stepping in blood themselves. So now this is a crime scene. This is a crime scene with a murderer or murderers on the loose. Want to travel with us? Every summer, Amelia and I take small groups of women away from the daily stressors of life in what we call river therapy. Imagine whitewater rafting in the most stunning locations across the USA, completely off the grid for up to five days, designed specifically for women who need a soul reset. Bring your stresses, anxieties, and fears, bring your dreams, wishes, and goals, and join us for River Therapy. Go to alexa-west.com and click on Glow Up Travel to join our next trip. Immediately, the police's attention and public suspicion turns to Meredith's roommate, Amanda, and her boyfriend, Raphael. You know, the couple kissing in front of the villa instead of grieving, or at least that's how they were painted. To make suspicions worse, there was a candlelight vigil held for Meredith in Perugia, but Amanda didn't attend. She doesn't go to the vigil for her roommate and you know, friend by circumstance. Instead, she and Raphael, they go to a friend's house for dinner. I mean, what do you make of that? I mean, that is kind of weird. What I'm gathering is like, they really did not get along. But you know, listen, you're 21. When you live with a bunch of girls, you butt heads, but you also forgive them. You're almost like sisters or siblings. That's kind of how I imagined it. Like, they're like, ugh, you know, I can't stand you sometimes, but we're in this together. My take on why Amanda didn't go to the vigil is this. By then, I think that Amanda knew that everyone would be looking at her. Hmm. Maybe she had already heard whispers that she was a suspect. And maybe she just, I mean, Amanda was not the kind of girl that wanted the spotlight at all. She was hyper, yeah, but she did not want the spotlight. And I could imagine that she was like, this is too raw, I don't want to go there and have people ask me and talk to me. I don't want to be there. And the media, I would imagine like the media (gasps) was completely all over it. So maybe she, she wanted to avoid all the cameras and the reporters asking all the awkward questions. Right. If she had like a PR representative, which, you know, obviously she wouldn't, but if she (laughs) did, the PR representative would say, Amanda, for optics, you need to go, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, for me, it's like, if you're guilty, you definitely have to go. Mm-hmm. Good point. Uh-huh. Thank you. So during this time, the autopsy comes back for Meredith. And they, yeah, that's when they discovered it was 40 wounds. And 
The police have kind of this theory. Meredith actually practices karate, so she does have self-defense skills. So they, the police concluded that 40 stab wounds and to hold this girl down, it could not have been done just by one person. They, out of nowhere, decided, oh, definitely had to be two people. But Meredith, her autopsy returns with a trace of an unknown male's DNA on her. So by this point, it's been two days since the incident. And police, they decide to go back to Amanda's house and they call Amanda to go back with them to do some like reenactments and to press her for some more details. So imagine being Amanda walking back into that house, the last place on earth that you want to be. And then you have these intimidating cops that want to speak about a crime in Italian. And by then her Italian's not great. So police are, they brought her back and they're like, okay, can you maybe just open these drawers and identify, do you have any, any knives missing? Because they were hoping like if Amanda could say, yes, this one knife is definitely missing, then they would be like, oh, that must be the murder weapon. And it must've come from inside the house. So they're just kind of doing shoddy police work at this point. Amanda's in the kitchen and she's looking at the knives and she's in the apartment and she's trying to picture like what could have happened. And all of a sudden it hits her right there in the kitchen. Amanda has a total breakdown. She is overcome with emotion, crying, sobbing, stuttering. It all hits her that her roommate was murdered in their apartment. There's a killer on the loose and Amanda is so far from home. And the police They note that this behavior by Amanda was strange, I guess, but they still didn't call her a suspect just yet. Still, so to me, that seems like normal human behavior. I know. I agree with you 100%. So then on November 5th, the police bring Raf into the police station for questioning. Amanda is scared and horrified and she doesn't want to be home alone. So she makes... uh, a horrible decision to go with Raphael to the police station. And I believe that if she didn't go with Raphael to the police station that night, we wouldn't even be here. But this is what happens. So they bring Raph in for questioning and they leave Amanda in the lobby. And Amanda is in shock and she's also trying to stay awake. They had Raphael in there for hours, 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 hours. So they're in the lobby of the police station. And Amanda starts stretching. She starts doing a little yoga. She does the splits. And most famously, she's doing cartwheels in the lobby. And this is the second time that police note Amanda's strange behavior. But if you ask anyone that knows Amanda, they'd say, yep, that girl can't sit still. She is a weirdo. We can all just agree. This girl's a little weird. We can all just agree. She's a little weird. Okay. She's a little weird. To me, I'm like, okay, that is weird. But if She's her weird. people would say that's normal for her, yeah. then that's normal for her. She's, she's a, I would say she's a little bit immature, to be honest. Mm. And that's fine. So the questioning of Raphael goes on for hours. They want to know, what were you doing that night? You know, were you involved? And they didn't like Raphael's stories. It just wasn't juicy enough for him to say, no, we were at home. So the police, you know, they spend hours asking him the same questions over and over, pressuring him to give answers he didn't have, telling him what happened and being like, right, that's what happened, right? And Raphael says that eventually he begins to lose his sense of reality after hours. And eventually he cracks under pressure and his story changes. He tells police that Amanda didn't arrive to his house until 1 a.m., And so then the police are like, oh, really? So they now want to see Amanda's phone to prove or deny that timeline. So they bring Amanda in and a PSA for everyone out there, never talk to the police in a foreign country without a lawyer and a translator. Okay. So they bring Amanda in and they're like, give me your phone. Also never hand over your phone. She hands over her phone. And they see a text message in her phone. So Amanda had gotten a job at a cafe in town and her boss's name was Patrick Lumumba. He's an immigrant from the Congo. And they hired, he hired Amanda being like, Amanda is outgoing. She's going to bring in more clients for me for sure. 
But the police find a text message on her phone and it's, hey, we're slow tonight. You don't need to come in tonight. So she texts, she texts back in Italian. We will see each other later. Have a good night. You know? And so she's like, okay, see you later. Have a good night. But the police were like, see you later? The police were like, oh, so you guys, you and Patrick Lumumba, you were planning to murder Meredith together. And this text message is proof. Come on. I know. They now, they want a confession. They want a confession out of Amanda. So Amanda now is the one getting roped into an interrogation on her own. An interrogation that would be absolutely torturous. She is traumatized. It's been, what, like three days of trauma. The police sit her down and they start questioning her. And the questioning turns aggressive. And they're using police tactics. You know, like psychological tactics, right? Remember that police interrogations are very psychological. Two hours, four hours, six hours. And they're yelling at Amanda in Italian, a language that she's still learning. And they, one of the police officers smacks her on the back of the head. He's like, remember, remember what happened. That should be illegal. Honestly, it's disgusting. There is a show on Netflix, a movie called The Confession Tapes. Oh, I want to watch that. Yes. It's about false confessions. False confessions happen all the time, especially under things like this, under duress like this. So she sticks to her story. She's like, no, I was at Raphael's house. We went to sleep around 10. I came home. Meredith was dead. That is it. But this interrogation style is enough to break down a grown woman, let alone a 21-year-old American girl, naive and scared and being screamed at in another language. And tired. Like you said, she was trying to stay awake. Like at that point, you're just like, I just want, to, I just want you to shut up and let me go and sleep, you know? Yeah, exactly. She just wanted it to end. And at some point, the police got what they wanted and they broke her. They broke her. And they finally get what they wanted. They finally get Amanda to admit what she did to Meredith. By 1.45 a.m., Amanda was broken. She was broken after being yelled at and hit. She started believing what they were telling her happened. They were feeding her stories. And she started believing them. She was being called a liar. And so she was like, why would these people... Why would they lie to me? I don't know. She just didn't know. So finally, Amanda cracks and they get her to say, they get her to at least agree. They were like, Patrick was there. He was there and he killed Meredith and you were there too. And eventually Amanda says that she started to believe it. And she agreed. That's what happened. The next day, like in the next days, she she rejected it twice in handwritten letters being like, I was, I mean, she told the truth. She was like, I was being screamed at. I was exhausted. I lost sense of reality. I couldn't believe why they were telling me I was lying. In that moment, I thought it could have been true. And those were her exact words, actually. But it was too late. That's gaslighting. If like three people around you are being like, no, this is what happened. And you know, if you're tired and confused and everything she was probably feeling at some point you gotta be like Mm -hmm. wait what if I am crazy like what if I like what if they are right I know and if anything that tells me that she's normal because she's able to be Mm -hmm. convinced that she's crazy so this was the beginning of Amanda's nightmare with the Italian prison system So Amanda and Raphael were jailed. And by this point, the media is becoming obsessed with the video of Amanda kissing Raphael in front of the house. They start making up a name for her. They're calling her Foxy Noxy because on her, like in her childhood, you know, soccer teams and stuff, it's what her friends called her. Not because she's sexy or like, you know, I don't know. It's just fun. It rhymes. Cute name. It rhymes. But That name is picked up by the media and the story spreads. This is the story that starts spreading. And this is the the accusation that starts spreading. The American girl and her boss from the Congo were sex fiends. And they were saying that 
Amanda and her boss, Patrick, engaged in a sex game and they used Meredith as a toy and the sex game went completely wrong and that Amanda and her boss killed Meredith. This is, this is without, listen, without evidence, okay? I was just going to ask about the evidence. Like, what about the DNA they found in Meredith? Why about, like, oh. what about, like, the shit in the bathroom? Who did it belong to? Well, I'm glad you asked because we found out, the police found out very quickly who it belonged to. The police found a bloody fingerprint on a Mer on Meredith's pillow and they were able to trace it back to the third man involved. Hey, it's Alexa West and I have a question for you. Have you ever wanted to write a book? Maybe you've started a few times, got halfway through a chapter and felt overwhelmed. Or maybe you have a ton of ideas but can't seem to get them on paper. Or maybe you're second guessing yourself, thinking, who am I to write a book? Because imposter syndrome is real, you guys. But I'm here to help you with all of this with my new course, Write Your Damn Book. I've written over 20 books and I've been in the writing and publishing industry since 2017. So if you want to write a nonfiction book, like a self-help, a memoir, a how-to, my course, Write Your Damn Book, is here to help you finally make that happen. In just 10 weeks, I guide you through my entire process, starting with my secret wallpaper method. It's the process that I use to turn all of my ideas into books, chapters, and a brilliant outline. I make writing a book feel easy and fun, instead of daunting and overwhelming. You'll get my personal tips, the lessons I've learned from all the years in this industry, and I'll show you exactly how to get your book into readers' hands. I also help you gain the confidence to allow people to actually read your writing, because that is scary. And best of all, this course will keep you on track with daily lessons delivered to your email so that you actually finish the damn thing. You'll also have accountability buddies and editing partners in our exclusive writing community. So if you can dedicate one hour a day, five days a week for 10 weeks, then I can help you write your damn book. You've got a story that needs to be told and the world is waiting to hear it. Meet me at alexa-west.com and click on write your book. So over four days of police investigation at the crime scene, they collected over 400 items. They're taking photographs of things, they're bagging things, but it was a very sloppy way. There was a bunch of people in and out of the house. There was cross-contamination everywhere, mishandlings everywhere. But the good news is they were able to trace that bloody fingerprint back to someone. And they used that DNA, the little DNA they found, and they traced it to a man, a man named Rudy Gude, G-U-E-D-E. -E. I think I'm saying it right. He is an immigrant from the Ivory Coast that the locals say is a very sketchy guy. He's a sketchy dude. The police go to Rudy's house. They raid his house. They take his toothbrush. And they're able to trace his DNA back to the crime scene on Meredith's bra strap, on the sleeve of her shirt, and on her body. Ugh. They have their guy. They found him. So by the time, though, that they realized, like, that they confirmed that it was him... Rudy had already taken off. He had already left the country to go to Germany. So an international arrest warrant was put out. They went, they got him, they brought him back to Italy. And get this, Emmy, he admitted to being there. He admitted to being in the house. Here's what he says happened. Rudy says that he had met Amanda and Meredith like the night before or the day before the murder when Rudy was playing basketball with their Italian neighbors downstairs. So he was known to the crew. He liked Meredith and Meredith liked him. So he came over to the house the next day and he and Meredith hooked up. He says they hooked up, things got physical, but they didn't have sex. He then says, okay, Emmy, I want, I cannot wait to hear what you think about this. He then says, yeah, like, you know, we hooked up. And then I had to go to the bathroom. So he says he went to the bathroom to poop and he started playing really loud rap music. Maybe he like was playing it so like she couldn't hear. I don't know. <laughs> But I still think it's weird. But he says that over the music, he could hear screams that while he was in the bathroom, 
someone had broken into the house, went into Meredith's room, and started attacking her. He says that he came out to see a man standing over Meredith, and then the man attacked Rudy, and so Rudy got cut, and the man ran off. Rudy went in, and he tried to help Meredith. He tried to stop the bleeding with towels in the house, but there was so much blood that he freaked out, and he ran. What a shitty guy. But still, you know, the good piece of news is that he admitted to being there. And also the other good piece of news is that Rudy says that Amanda was never there. Rudy says Amanda wasn't in the house. That's great, right? So we have a guy, we have his DNA. He admitted to being there. So that should mean that Amanda and Raphael are set free, right? Yeah, to me, that's a case closed. It's case closed. And maybe they're still looking for someone else. At the very worst, like they keep Raphael because Rudy's like, I saw a guy there, but they let Amanda go. Or they find the, f- the fourth person, like the alleged fourth person there. Right. It's a tiny yeah. town. I mean, not too tiny, but. It's a smaller town, right. So then Rudy is in jail and there's more interrogations. And surprise, surprise, behind bars, his story changes. Oh, come on. And. Police get him to say that he saw Amanda's silhouette. He's like, so I imagine that confession is like, she was there. She was there. And he just probably was like, no, she's not. She was there. Okay, fine. I saw her silhouette. Like, you know what I mean? So even with this DNA of the man and the matching to Meredith, the courts and the court of public opinion were still determined to make Amanda pay. And I'm not going to lie, I've been to Italy, and the locals are both extremely charming and welcoming, but also, they're also like, fuck these foreigners. I mean, it does kind of make sense, like, they would make, like, the foreigner the scapegoat. They already have one foreigner, like, but everyone, they still wanted Amanda. They wanted Foxy Noxy. By this point, the media had painted a story. The police had painted a story. The Italian, you know, public opinion, they had decided that... It was the American. It was the American girl with, with her boyfriend. News channels could not get enough of this story as this was going down. TV shows dissected every juicy detail, turning Amanda Knox into a creepy household name overnight. They wanted to see that Amanda Knox, this monster they'd painted in the media, was going to go down for this murder. Well, they got what they wanted. Because in 2009... Amanda Knox and Raphael Selecito were officially charged with the sexual assault and murder of Meredith Kircher. What? With no evidence at all. I'm going to get into the evidence because they say they have evidence. They say they do. Here's the evidence used against Amanda and Raphael. Number one, DNA evidence. They said that they found a knife in Raphael's house with Amanda's DNA on it. So they said that she had like DNA, Amanda's DNA was on the handle of a knife, but they said we found Meredith's DNA on the blade of the knife. But it's like microscopic. And let me tell you guys about DNA. Blood and saliva show up the same. They show up the same. And there was like so much cross-contamination that this is bullshit. And eventually- This was thrown out. The next thing is the bra clasp. Remember how Meredith's bra was, it was cut off, but they didn't find the clasps. And while they took photos of her bra, they didn't bag it. You would think that they would bag her bra. They didn't bag it. But later, when they go back, like months later to the crime scene, after, you know, people have been in and out, in and out, in and out, someone found the like clips to her bra. And they said that they found Raphael Selecito's DNA on the clasp of her bra. That was another one. But again, cross-contamination. Cross-contamination. And the defense would argue cross-contamination. So that was like a very, it's very weak, very weak. And then there's the behavioral evidence. People were scrutinizing Amanda's behavior that we talked about. And then there's the inconsistent statements. The prosecution was like, oh, you know, she changed her story a bunch and she implicated herself and the bar owner, Patrick Lumumba. 
And then there's phone records. So phone records showed that Amanda and Raphael turned their phones off during the time frame when the murder likely occurred. Um, that one does sound a little bit weird. I mean, if you're watching a movie with your boyfriend, maybe you're going to put it in silent mode, but you're not going to turn it off. Well, this was the time of clicky phones, right? In 2007. Oh, good point. It was a clicky phone. Like we weren't attached to our phones. Like no, we are we now. Weren't. And you know, like those things when they vibrated, they were like the whole house would vibrate. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. And in 2007, we were like, we're new to phones. Gosh, did I even, I did. I had a, I had a flip phone in 2007. However, many of these pieces of evidence were heavily criticized for contamination, mishandling, lack of reliability. So in 2007, on November 1st is when Meredith Kircher was murdered. November 2nd is when everyone found her. Then in 2008, in October, Rudy Gaudet is convicted of murder and sexual assault in a fast track trial. He is sentenced to 30 years in prison. Oh. Again, it's 2008. I bet Amanda is behind bars being like, thank God. Thank God mm -hmm. they have him. They're going to let me go. But that is not what happened. Not at all. On December 4th, 2009, Amanda Knox walks into the courtroom in Perugia, Italy after waiting four years for a verdict. And in that courtroom on that day, Amanda Knox was found guilty of the brutal sexual assault and murder of her roommate, Meredith Kircher. Doesn't make any sense. And... Most importantly, and I want everyone to remember this because we're going to continue to talk about this. She was also charged with defamation against Patrick Lumumba, and she is sentenced to 26 years in prison. And I don't want to just brush over that. I feel like so many podcasts or TV shows that I've watched about Amanda over the years haven't talked about what that really means for Amanda. Amanda is going to prison. She is going to Capane Prison, which sounds really nice, right? Capane Prison sounds like somewhere I'd love to be, but it's not. Inmates there in this prison, they spend around 22 hours a day in their cells, and they have just two hours for recreation. But those two hours, they're in like a really tiny prison yard, and it's heavily monitored. And when she goes back to her room for 22 hours a day, her room is nothing but a bed, a desk, and a TV. And I wonder if she ever got to watch the news. I wonder if she had to sit in that cell away from her family and friends and dreams and watch the world slander her. She had to know that that is what was going on outside of those walls. And what I've wondered the most over these years, let's say she's innocent. How much time does she sit thinking, how the hell did I get here? I was just this normal college girl last year with a dream of going to Italy and learning the language and doing something good for my future. And now I'm here in this prison, accused of killing someone. She never could have imagined that this is how her one-way ticket to Italy was going to turn out. I am furious. <laughs> I know you are. I've loved watching your face during this episode. Um, but listen, get your face ready because we're only halfway through. There's more. Let me tell you about Raphael, what happened to him. So Raphael is also convicted in the same trial of murder and sexual assault. And he is sentenced to 25 years in prison. He has less time than Amanda. Amanda has an extra year because of the defamation. And the defamation is, you know, when she said, oh, yeah, I guess he was there. But I mean, how can they how can they charge Amanda for like the whole sex game thing? I know. The alleged sex game thing with her boss. Mm -hmm. But her boss doesn't get charged. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but that's where the defamation came in. They're like, oh, Patrick, you didn't do it. You're free to go. But Amanda did point her finger at you, so she gets defamation against you. We're so sorry about that. How rude of her. It should have been defamation against the police. Like, the police were the ones who came up with that story for the, base, the first place. That's exactly my point. That's ex 
that's exactly what I've been thinking. The defamation should be against the police, not against Amanda. They were literally like, this is what ha- happened, Amanda. This is what happened. And she's like, oh, I guess it's what happened. And then they're like, slander. They would be like, oh, that's not what happened? Okay, then that story canceled, gone. Canceled. That's not what happened, canceled. Oh, oh. Okay, we got to keep going, though, because Rudy, in the same month and year, December 2009, he appeals his conviction, and he gets his 30-year prison sentence taken down to 16 years. But hold on to your hats, Emmy, because the drama was far from over. Four years later... In 2011, get this, Raphael and Amanda had appealed their conviction based on basically everything you and I just said. On appeal, the murder and sexual assault convictions of Amanda and Raphael were overturned. So they were acquitted. Wait, what's acquitted? Acquitted means like the charges are dropped. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they were released from prison. During that time in 2011, Amanda hightails it back to Seattle as she would. And, you know, the Italians were like, what a coward. She should stay and like face this stuff. And it's like, are you insane? Get the hell out of there. She got out of there. Yeah. She was, she, she already got stuck there for like four years Four years uh, in prison. However, Amanda's conviction for defamation is still upheld. So everyone remember that. Then in 2013, March, 2013, Italy's Supreme Court annuls the acquittal, which means they reverse the acquittal. So first, Amanda and Raphael were charged. Then they're like, oh, you're acquitted. And now they are being like, oh, never mind. That acquittal is bullshit. And they order, the Italian court in March 2013 orders a retrial. Honestly, at this point, I would be like, you know what, guys? Like, we have, like, bigger problems to solve and, like, new murders to solve. Like, let's stop wasting people people's taxes on this. Yes. Then, oh, my God. In March 2015, again, the Italy Supreme Court definitively acquits Amanda and Raphael of the murder charges, ending legal proceedings against them. However, in that case, the jury ruled that the DNA against Rudy Gaudet still holds up, and he was the last one to be charged with her murder. Hmm. After all of these years, it would have been eight years, she was finally vindicated. She was finally free. So, Emmy, why did this case, why do you think this case took over the world as it did? I think, one, the fact that she was a foreigner and an American. And two, I think it was because of who she was. Amanda was so, I mean, she is still so beautiful. Dude, I agree. And I, if you don't mind, Emmy, I have a theory on this topic that I would like to present to you and our cult members here on True Crime Travelers. Because this isn't a theory that I could just say one time as like a blanket statement sentence because it sounds so stupid. But once you break it down, you realize that the simplest answer is the answer. And by that, I mean, how did we get here? How did this foxy, noxy, media storm begin. And I'm going to tell you. So back in 2007, we loved reality TV. This is when the Kardashians were coming out, like keeping up with the Kardashians. This was like, I don't know, post Laguna Beach, like people loved obsessing over reality TV. And I'm going to say something that I sincerely believe. I believe we were a lot stupider back then. I think that the internet has done a lot of terrible things for the world, but one thing it has done is that it's made us understand that things are not one-dimensional and that the Mm -hmm. Kardashians are not real, that the Paris Hilton doing that weird show she did with Nicole Richie, like that's not real. But now we know that. But like back in the day, we kind of loved being fed drama and bullshit on TV. And I think people forgot that Amanda yeah. Knox is a girl because now she's Foxy Noxy. Now she's a sensation. Yeah. It's that being a person and turn into this character. And yeah, you're right. Back then it was the golden 
era mm-hmm. of tabloids. Oh my God, of tabloids. I detest tabloids, but yeah. This was the time that like Britney was being like chased by tabloids, you know? Is that the year she shaved her head? What year did Britney shave her head? If this, if this was the same year, this is a new conspiracy theory of mine. 2007! Britney shaved her head in 2007. Tabloids were running the world Oh my gosh, get this. MTV Cribs was still a thing. And it turns out that like MTV would rent houses for people to make them seem richer than they were. And that like it kind of gave into this disparity oh of like, I love Paris Hilton and Britney. They have the most amazing life. Yes, it, tabloids. We were just spoon fed and loving it. All of this disgusting dirt on TV. And Amanda Knox got wrapped into that. Oh, you know what too? It was the year that iPhones were launched. No. So it was like a year where like we were getting hit with a lot of more information. Oh my fucking God. Emmy, that's huge. Mm-hmm. We did not know to question the news back in the day. In 2007, we were still like, oh yeah, like, you know, CNN, whatever CNN says is, is the truth. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, we were stupider. We were a lot. It's not that we we're stupider. We were naive. <laughs> We were naive back then. We Yeah, we were still newer to this whole social media information from coming from every, everywhere all the time. Now we are like, oh, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Back then, it was, I think the internet was more trustworthy, I guess, or at least we thought so. Yeah, that's what they wanted you to think. I think for the sake of remaining objective, we should always consider the other possibility in every case that we talk about. So maybe we should consider for a minute, what if she did do it? Okay. We have an expression in Spanish. <laughs> we say, cuando el río suena, agua lleva, which means that if a river is making a sound, it's because there's it's carrying water. Mm. So it's basically our way of saying that sometimes when a rumor happens, it's because Probably some of it is true. Let's say she did it. So she and Raphael and Rudy, this guy that they barely knew, they decided that they're all going to have an orgy with Meredith, who wasn't really that type of girl. She didn't like talking about sex out loud. And so maybe Meredith was like, what? We're having an orgy? And they're like, yeah, we are. And she's like, no, thank you. And then all of them hold her down, stab her together. They're laughing. They're high-fiving. Someone goes in the bathroom, takes a poop. Another one like walks around with their bloody footprints, and then then they go their separate ways. <laughs> you know what I mean? This this definitely wasn't the perfect murder. Okay, and you know, for you to say that this wasn't the perfect murder, that tells us more that you know this wasn't planned. This was not premeditated. This was really sloppy murder and a really sloppy. No, I don't think it investigation. was investigation. If it had been premeditated, then how do do you explain the broken window? (gasps) The broken window. Tell me what you think about the broken window. Because that's something else that a lot of other people are... It's a smoking gun. I think the broken window is definitely related to this. So the broken window was found in Meredith Kircher's room. And the prosecution argued that it was staged to look like a break-in. But let's consider the alternative here. The window could have been broken by an intruder. So there were reports of burglaries in the area around that time. And if you ask me, Rudy was one of the people linked to the burglaries in that area around that time. And they're saying that, okay, there's this huge rock outside the house. And then there is a hole in the window with glass inside the house, meaning that the rock came from outside to inside. But it looked like someone smashed a window and left. It doesn't actually look like like someone used it to break in. That's why I think the broken window is just a distraction. So the glass was found on top of Meredith's belongings in her room. If we go through like a normal break-in, right? You break the window, that's step one. The glass falls. Then you ransack the room, which means the glass goes everywhere. But in this case, the room was ransacked and then there was glass on top of it, meaning that the window was broken after the break-in. You know what I'm saying? I think you're right. I think the window is a very overlooked 
piece of evidence that speaks a lot. Just the fact that the broken window was already Rudy's MO for burglary. Come on. Can't be a coincidence, you know? Mm -hmm, totally. I think Rudy did it. I think all the evidence points to Rudy, including this stage break-in. He is a known criminal. I think that after he killed Meredith, he panicked and he locked her door. I Wait, let me tell you. I'm going to break it down what I think really happened, okay? Here's what I think happened. I think that Rudy was invited to Meredith's house. From his lawyer statement, he says that Meredith let him in the cottage around 9 p.m., and he says that they kissed and they touched, but they did not have sex because they did not have condoms ready. Half of this story is true. I believe that he, I hope he was invited over. I believe he was invited over. I believe they did start hooking up and they did have sex. Rudy's DNA was found inside of Meredith, confirming they had sex. Now the question is, was it consensual? Did he push it on her? Did he maybe push the sex on her that she didn't want? And that is where the aggression came from. And then now we're in a crime of passion and maybe, you know, she does karate. Maybe she hit him a few times that really angered him. Maybe she was defending herself and it really angered him. I then think he went to the bathroom to clean up. He, that's when he took his poop that he left behind, which is like the dumbest thing ever, which also tells me it wasn't premeditated. And then I think that he thought about disposing of her body or at least cleaning up. He went back to the room. He got towels. And I think he was like, no, I can't. There's no way I'm going to be able to get rid of her body. So he locked the door, closed it. And then he thought, oh my gosh, people knew that I was with her. So I need to stage a break-in. And so he goes outside. He takes this big, heavy rock. Obviously, it is not a practical rock for breaking in and throwing. He threw it. It didn't go all the way through the window. It just did enough to smash the window and scatter some glass. And then he ran. Now, some people say, why, if Rudy is a known burglar, would he want this crime scene to look like a burglary? Because that would just point right back to him. But you've got to remember that Rudy, he's a criminal. Criminals run in circles of other criminals. They know other burglars. They they give each other tips, you guys. Like burglars give each other advice and tips. And I think in Rudy's mind, he was like, oh, like I know some people that are more, more violent than me or some sketchy characters. I think that he actually thought that by breaking a window, he would be diverting to maybe the sketchier criminals that he knew. And then he fled the country. And then we had this media storm. And then... Unfortunately, Meredith Kircher, she's kind of been forgotten in all of this. Even when we did, we decided to do this episode on this, I told you, I was like, I want this episode to be more about Meredith. And then as I went, I realized I couldn't because this is Amanda's story too. And I don't want that to like overshadow the life that was lost and taken from Meredith, but Amanda's life will never be the same. Here's what Amanda's doing now. Amanda, oh my gosh, I have to I have to Google this. Amanda's living in Seattle and she's married and she has two kids. Oh, I'm so happy for her. Now, get this, Emmy. Do you remember Monica Lewinsky? Of course. So now there's a new show coming out produced by Monica Lewinsky. And it is about Amanda, I do believe. So Amanda is profiting from Netflix and a memoir and a podcast. So some people are being like, oh, she's just loving this. And it's like, no, no, she, if you ask me, she should profit from all of it yeah. because there is no amount of money that is ever going to make up for the years that were taken from her and the private life that was stolen for her. Totally. Yeah. She was robbed of years of her life and she's a victim too. Yeah. I mean, she was like in prison for like four years, but then it's been like a 20 year old roller coaster, you know? That's like time she's never gonna get back. And, okay. And get this it's not over. I know. It's not over. What do you mean it's not over? You are never gonna believe this. There have been developments in the Amanda case. You're gonna rage. Literally, Amanda is in Italy again on trial again. Ca como? Yes. But why? Because you remember the charge that was still upheld? The defamation one. Uh-huh. 16 years later, Amanda is summoned back to Italian court to stand trial again. Not for Meredith, but for Patrick Lumumba. 
So Patrick Lumumba, Amanda's boss, who the prosecutors forced her to implicate. Patrick Lumumba, though, is still suing Amanda for slander. So he probably has realized like now Amanda's like big yeah. things are happening. So maybe now he's like, oh, oh, I can make money out of this. Great point. Great point. So Amanda went back to Italy and she felt like this was going to be her opportunity to clear her name once and for all. And she actually posted on social media the other day, like, I'm going back to clear my name. And there's video from yesterday. And she said, like, I, she said all the same things. I was a little girl. I was under duress. I was pressured. I was coerced. I am sorry that pa- that I said that to Patrick. From the beginning, she's been saying, no, no, no. Like like days after the implication, she was writing notes being like, no, that never happened. I was confused. She has been apologetic for all of these years. But Amanda, she thought she was going to come out of the courtroom and talk to press and say, I've finally been yeah. you know, free. And instead, she was so upset that she couldn't talk to press. She really didn't think this was going to happen. But I think that she went back being like, you know what? I want to go clear mm. my name. There's this, you know, this dream of of Italy for Amanda that she never got to experience. Yeah. She speaks Italian. She has a lot of trauma to heal. And going back to a place can be helpful if, it, if you've given yourself enough time. But instead, she went back and she just thought, of course, it's going to be overturned. This is ridiculous. It's 20 years later. But no. So that's where we are today is that Amanda, there isn't, there's going to be sentencing or something soon. Mm -hmm. Um, But Amanda had already, she'd been sentenced to three years back in the day for accusing him. And she already spent that time. They already said like she spent that time, like she spent her time. So there's not going to be prison time, but we will let you guys know on our website, like what ends up happening. This is kind of like unrolling and unraveling. Justice for Amanda. Justice for Amanda, motherfuckers. This whole story is infuriating. I'm really jealous that you can say that word and I can't. Infuriating. Which one? Infuriating. Infuriating. Oh my God, it's one of like the easy words in English. What? You are full of it. It's one of those words that just like rolls no, it off does. your tongue, I you know? Infuriating. No, it doesn't. Infuriating. <clears throat> unlike, infuriating. Unlike refrigerator. Refrigerator is so hard. <laughs> refrigerator. Refrigerator. Yeah. It's hard. I used to be an English teacher. I know English makes no sense. Absolutely not. Emmy tells me every day. She never lets me forget that English makes no sense. <laughs> I mean, Spanish doesn't either, especially Mexican, but wait, English doesn't make no sense. And I will die on this hill. I will. You can die on that hill. And the hill that I will die on, we're taking a tangent, is that I speak Mexican. I do not speak Spanish. Yes, you do. I speak Mexican. And you speak Northern Mexican. See? Si? Yeah, you speak Norteño. You speak, I mean, you learn to speak like the Sinaloense kind of Spanish. See? Si. Yeah. And my family. Doing my best out here. Okay, that's our tangent of the day. So travel lesson of the episode, I think is very clear. And this goes for, honestly, the States as well, like your own home or, you know, your home country. Never talk to police without a lawyer, even if you think you can talk your way out of something. And also never go into an interrogation without a translator that is on your side because it turns out I think that the translator also um, betrayed Amanda a bit and never sign anything you can't read particularly in a legal setting demand documents in English make make sure you have your team do the best you can because they'll break you down if they can and that's where you'll get in trouble Okay, well, that is that for this episode. I am sure that people have opinions and we want to hear them. You can always go on our website and leave us like little comments or leave us, yeah, leave us comments down below. I don't know. I don't know where comments are left on podcast to you. Uh, no, that's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, you can leave them in, on, on the blog post that's going to have all the information about this case. Okay, good. And I mean, it looks like we're definitely going to have a follow up on this case at some point. So excited for that. Yeah, guys, keep keep an eye out because I mean, I we will start doing follow up cases and we're going to be start doing like Q&A's with you guys and we can talk to you about the cases too. 
Okay, where are we going next? Next week, we're traveling around the USA in a van. It's a van life episode. So if you've ever been curious about van life, digital nomad life, working from your laptop, or traveling with your partner in a very closed space, check out next week's episode, starting in New York. Oh, interesting. Chan, chan, chan. Chan, chan, chan. We'll see y'all in New York next week. Okay, I'm excited for that. Me too. Okay, Miha. Talk to you later. Enjoy time with your family. Thank you. And travel safe, everyone. Travel safe. Safety is sexy. If you're enjoying this podcast, Amelia and I would be so happy if you could take a minute and leave us a review. This helps us reach other listeners like you. This podcast deals with real crimes, but all parties mentioned are innocent until proven guilty, and all opinions expressed are solely those of myself and Amelia. We do our best to research and provide accurate and up-to-date information, but keep in mind that some details may change over time, so we encourage listeners to conduct their own research and verify the information presented in this podcast. Thanks for listening and safe travels.